asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. We're off to Oz now. It's in the small hours of the morning there. Was due to speak to my uh, guest, um, whom you know all about, a bit earlier today, my time. But because it was rush hour, in fact, it was, um, I suppose, not just traffic, not just cars and bikes, but internet traffic-wise, at 5pm um, yesterday, his time wasn't ideal. So he's agreed to get up out of bed at the crack of dawn uh, to speak to us. Um, you know all about him. He's an artist, he's an activist, a humanitarian, a terrific public speaker, journalist, writer. And uh, you can check him out at thecrowhouse.com. Check out The Crow House. Let's welcome back to the programme. Our friend, Max Egan, 4.30 a.m. How are you, mate? You all right? I'm good, brother. I'm good. It's good to be up. I was awake anyway. I just couldn't sleep. I'm still keeping odd hours. I've been travelling so much. My body doesn't know what time zone it's in anyway. So it's all good, brother. Yeah, you've, be been around, you've been around, haven't you? You've been in Europe for quite a bit and you've been elsewhere in the world. You've just returned home. So um, how's it been, the travelling? Oh, it's been full on, Richie. I tell you, 19 months on the road, brother. 19 months. I went around the world two and a half times, I think. I don't know what time zone I'm in anymore. And uh, here I am back in Australia. But it looks like I'm going to be traveling again. I just got offered to go and do a TED Talk in the Azores next month. Oh, lovely. Which is the opposite side of the world to where I am now. So Sounds good, I'm mate. I'm seriously considering that as well. I'm going to say something now that I didn't tell you about. And you don't have to say anything to this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Because I've been in touch with one or two people recently and I've tried to exert a bit of friendly pressure on them. I just want to say that um, we're approaching the, what are we approaching, July 2018. And I just want to say that it's, it's not as if I needed to say this or that you needed to hear it. But you've long been thoroughly vindicated for what you did back in 2015 when you showed um, a, a tremendous amount of courage to blow the whistle on fraudulent behaviour by somebody that you at one time used to work very closely with. And at that time, a lot of things were said about you. Nasty things were said about you by a lot of people, including the guy himself. All sorts of promises were made. But in late, um, well not late, but in mid-summer 2018, the person I'm referring to is still pathologically lying about um, schemes going to go ahead Nearly three years after $115,000 was raised, he's still calling people subversives and calling them Jews. When there's no sign whatsoever that any of the promises made were going to be carried out, I'm still getting emails and I've got them here. I've got the proof from people begging me to, not that I can do anything because the guy has, there's no, he's no intentions of answering me, begging me for some answers as to where their money went while he's going around the world asking people for money for other schemes negate you know forgetting the fact that he has a scheme ongoing three years later nearly nothing has happened i've called him a fraud a charlatan a criminal a coward a vile scumbag that's what he is and um, you don't have to say anything to this but you've been thoroughly vindicated in coming out and saying what you said back in 2015 that's all i'm going to say about it if you have anything to say about it mate do if you don't we'll move on um, look, you know, it's 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 sad. The whole thing's sad. I mean, I, I I never enjoyed doing what I did. It was one of the most uncomfortable things I've ever had to do, but uh, it needed to be done. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a shame that it all happened. And yeah, I mean, I, I think I've been vindicated. I mean, it, it, he's done this so many times in the past. I've uncovered at least eight or ten fundraisers he's done like this previously. And um, yeah, it just it was the right thing to do. Yeah, next, next topic, sorry. Yeah, good man. And, and, and it's not that I want the last word. I don't have to get the last word, but I just want to add to that. To endorse what Max said, more at least a half a dozen times, this cretin has run schemes to raise money for charities or for people far less fortunate than ourselves. The whole things have gone, the, 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 the things have gone tits up, basically. And he's been left holding a bag of money. Nobody ever got their money back. And he blamed subversives and infiltrators because he's the most important man in the world and the Jews are out to get him. This guy is scum, folks. Don't give him any money and give him a wide berth. No more to say about him tonight anyway. Hey, listen, you've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years talking about um, 5G, the rollout of that, the so-called space fence Wi-Fi. What a fascinating bit of news, my friend, to come out of Devon in this country the other day where parents 
told a primary school, listen, we're not having our children in this school if this gigantic mast continues to be located only a stone's throw from the building. Max, you're starting to wake some people up on this issue, mate. It's really good. It's really good to see the school standing up, the family standing up and doing this anyway. I'd like to see more schools follow suit. I mean, people don't realize the dangers of 5G. It really is bad. Um, We've seen bird populations decline all over the place, insect populations declining all over the place. Uh, There's been so many reports of people getting sick from these things. Even in areas in the United States where I think they were testing 5G, I was having weird sort of head waves happening in my head while I was over there. I mean, it's it's just very, very toxic technology, and it's great to see people standing up about it. There should be should be more of it. There really should. Tell us about that head wave that you experienced. That's one out of the blue now. Um, where were you? And give us a description of what it was like, Max. Well, it's just, just weird, like almost um, kind of dizziness, almost like I was stepping outside of myself, almost like a, a pressure thing in my head. Um, strange really strange like a, almost a, a fainting thing a blood pressurey thing it was really weird i was almost thinking of going to the hospital and having some blood pressure bar pressure tests but uh, i was in la and um i think i was in i was in venice venice or santa monica and i think they were testing 5g in the area and i was just getting these weird waves i mean i don't know whether it was my health or whether it was just because i was been awake too long or traveling too long but i just thought it was remarkable that they were testing in the area and I was getting these weird sort of blood pressure feelings in my head. So, yeah. That's interesting. I don't know whether it was related, but, uh, you know, it's just something that I experienced. I haven't haven't experienced since I moved away from L.A., since I moved out of that area. I only experienced it when I was in Venice. That was my so, next yeah. question, because where you live in Australia, you're not surrounded by that sort of stuff at all. If, if I'm right, because I remember speaking to you years ago, and I think you, you still live in the same place, and I heard, um, as you would say, my friend, Chuck's, in the background, and I loved it um, in the early morning, because often I speak to you, it's in the early a.m. there. So I understand that where you live, you're not surrounded by this stuff. Yeah, we don't even get um, mobile signal where I live. There's no right. Wi-Fi here at all. I've got a, a cable running to the computer here, so there's no Wi-Fi. And yeah, it's good. It's a really, really clear environment where I live. So I really notice that when I move away from here, when I go and travel, I really notice the uh, electronic environments everywhere. When I go to Mexico and speak at Anacapulco, I can't sleep for the whole time I'm there just because of the Wi-Fi in the in the hotel. There's so much of it, you know. I'd be willing to bet that it must be the Wi-Fi because your normal environment is your home, whereas you said you can't even get a cell phone signal. So if you're not exposed to it, you're going to be a little bit more vulnerable than the rest of us. Now, I'm living in Manchester City Centre. I can see, well, no, I'd be lying if I said I can see one. There's a wall in the way, but there's one just across the street from um, where our house is. And it's not even a case you could move somewhere and get away from them. They're everywhere. I, I don't want to say too much on this because we've spoken a lot about it and there's loads of things we can talk about. But on that, when I m- mentioned you were coming on, obviously a lot of our listeners... Um, fascinated by this subject and the question came up about water. Is there any evidence that the groundwater or waters in reservoirs that we would drink from is this technology doing anything structurally to the water? Do we know? I couldn't answer you on that, Richie. That's quite an interesting Isn't question. It? Yeah. I'd like to find out about that. So would I, mate, no, and it's not my question. Yeah, it's, it's a listener. I'd love to say it's my question. The listener put this to me this afternoon and said, Richie, ask Max, is there any evidence? Because the listener presumably suspects that this frequency must affect the makeup of water. Well, you, the, yeah. You'd think so. It, it must. I mean, it affects everything else, whether it affects the molecular structures, whether it affects water clusters. It's a very, very interesting thing. I might um, see if I can find some tests on that. Or if anyone is listening, if, if anyone has any means of conducting some tests like that, it would be... A great thing to find out. Good stuff, because we're all obviously made up of 99 point whatever percent it is water we are anyway as as, as people. We the, Since we last spoke, um, I don't want to use terms like kicked off because it's disrespectful to the Palestinians, but things got nasty at the Nakba remembrances, of course, in, in Palestine. Um, more than 100 people killed, people... Um, injured, hundreds and hundreds of people injured, children. We had a lovely young woman, a medic, was shot dead when she was trying to, to, to help people. I know you've been watching that on, on your travels. Did you think this time, Max, just this time, that there might just have been 
a little bit more of a movement against it by some elements of the political class and by some elements of the media. It seems that it was spoken about more this time than in recent mass murders by the Israelis, or is it just a nonsense? What do you think? Look, it was was spoken about a little bit, but we didn't see any any result. I didn't really expect to see any result. You never do. Um, you know, Israel just plays these things, and, and the media just plays it, and the Palestinians suffer. And you know, when you see what they did in those um, those wall demonstrations, I mean, it's just pure frustration. These people have been locked up in this prison for ten years now. It's just absurd. And the, the children growing up, they've got no idea what freedom is. They've they've lived through wars. You know, the whole life of war, that's all they've ever known. And uh, it's terrible. I mean, they've really put a lot of pressure on them. They've actually opened Rafah border at the moment, and Palestinians are flooding out of Gaza as quickly as they can. Thousands of people want to leave because they've just had enough. And that's what Israel wants. That's why Israel does it this way, because they just want to pressure them so that they'll go away. They just want them to go away so they can claim the land. And that's what's happening. I've actually um, I've, um, got a friend in, in Palestine at the moment who's speaking with the Palestinian Authority, and I've approached the Egyptian embassy yesterday so I can try to actually get into Gaza because if rougher crossings open, then there's a chance I might be able to get in there. There's a film that I want to make. There's a little girl that I met in Gaza in 2012. Her name is Noor. Um, she was eight when I met her. And I promised her I'd come back. And I, I'd really like to go back and say, I want to make a film called Finding Noor. And I want to go back and find this little girl. She'd be 14 now. And she's lived through two wars since I've seen her. And she was such a bright light. She was my major helper on the schoolroom. She kind of adopted me when I was building the schoolroom because she doesn't have any parents. And so I was her new father sort of thing. And um, I grew very, very fond of her. And I'd love to go back and just find that she's safe. And I'd like to film it. And I'd like to make a, a documentary about it. So that's that's another thing that I've got uh, on the plate. It's really weird. Like, I've just done 19 months travel. And it's so good to get home. And I really need the rest. But as soon as I get here, I get offered this trip to the Azores. <laughs> I'm being lured by sunken pyramids and stuff off the Azores. And then I find out Rafa Crossing's open. So I'm thinking, well, maybe I can do that and then go to Gaza and then maybe have a holiday. And uh, it's just it's just full on. But uh, you've got to take these opportunities when they come. And the, op- the opportunity for Rafa Crossing to be open and for me to actually be able to get in there is just it's too good to pass up. So Very that's emotional. something I'm going to try to do in the next week. Well, good luck with that. I mean, not, not to be, you know, focusing on it, but obviously you sounded very emotional there talking about that young girl. She was eight at the time and obviously she had a profound effect on you. I suppose when, when I mean, I've never been to a place as badly affected by oppression and totalitarianism as Gaza has been, at least not while it's going on anyway. So I don't know, but I, I, I can probably understand or guess that you, it hurts you when you see the children because obviously the children don't know what's going on. The adults do. It doesn't make it any easier, but they understand what's going on, but children have no idea. And you don't know much as to whether she's hale and hearty, Max, and, and alive. You just don't know that yet. Is that right? No, I've got no idea. I've, I haven't heard any word from her at all. I've put out, she, she went missing in the, um, in the 2014 aggression um, but then I, I heard that she was okay, she was safe, uh, and I haven't heard anything since then. And I just, I just love to to make that connection again because I promised her I'd come back, and it was a, it was a big thing for me. It was a going there and building that schoolroom and and connecting with those children. It was a, it was a really big moment in my life, and um, this is one promise I made to one little girl that I would really like to keep. Is it a hardship, and, Max, when you go to places like that, and you you meet children? And children in those parts of the world, when you see, you know, whether it's North Africa, the Middle East, and you see footage on television, they seem to be so full of joy when they meet outsiders, you know, when they meet people from another country and so full of curiosity. Is it hard to come to terms with having to leave people behind, particularly people that don't have parents or, you know, family like Noor, for example? Is it difficult to just oh, to leave? Yeah. It's so painful. It's so painful, Richie. It's incredible. Like when I was leaving, she was she she came running up to me and she said, "Max, I can fit in your suitcase." Oh Jesus! And uh, I just I just cried when she said that. <sighs> and um, you know, it's so hard. It's so so incredibly hard to leave these children behind when you're in a place like that. It's it's uh it's it's terribly hard, Richie. It is. Yeah, I can't imagine yeah. it, mate. 
Is there any opposition to this in in Tel Aviv? I, I don't mean political. I, I know that you've rubbed up against um, Israelis, Jews. I separate Israelis and Jews, to be honest. For me, a Jew is an identity group, just like a Christian. You know, I don't believe in organised religion, so I don't believe Jew is an ethnicity. It's just somebody who believes in a certain form of religion and they identify and they, they come together. That's what I believe. Not to insult anybody, it's what I believe. But ha have you encountered in your time there Jews and Israelis working hard to to put right these terrible wrongs? Because whenever I speak to people about this situation, I do get emails from people in this country, Jewish people. Not many, but occasional ones. And they say, you know, it's terrible that you always portray this terrible situation and you don't acknowledge that in Israel there's huge opposition to it and there are people genuinely committed to you know a pre-1967 border solution did you encounter such people Max in your time traveling in the area look I've got a really wonderful friend actually I haven't heard from her for a while I've got a wonderful Jewish friend who lives in uh in, in Ramallah in West Bank who who lives as close to the Palestinian border as she can possibly get and she's a wonderful woman, and she helps the Palestinians as much as she can. She sends me information about um, when Israel is staging false flag attacks and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, not all the Israeli people are, are bad people. Not all Jewish people are bad people. You know, it's just the, the criminal mafia that runs the place. That's the thing. All governments work together. We've got this criminal mafia that's running all governments, Richie. That's the thing. They all yeah. work together. You know, all of this is theatre. It's all theatre. All enemies are contrived. There are no real enemies. Governments all cook this up together. You know, Israel needs the Palestinians there. It needs Gaza there. It needs all these terrorists at its doorstep to get all the funding it can to run all this ISIS campaign, all the stuff that's going on. It's all, it's all one big theatre show. It really is. You know, we're seeing a lot of it pulled down at the moment. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's going on with Trump and Q and all this deep state stuff being undermined. Sure, this is all happening, but people aren't looking at the bigger picture and the fact that all governments are criminal enterprises anyway. That's what they are, all of them. You know, we don't need them. They're an unnecessary organization. It's, it's racketeering. That's all government is. It just gets in the way of everything we want to do as a human race and, and makes, it takes a cut from it all and makes us all walk between the lines. That's all government is, you know, so... You know, the whole thing is theatre, and there are a lot of Jewish people who are really, really outraged about what their government is doing in the Pal in the Palestinian region. So, yeah, you can't you can't just blanket hate an entire race of people. You can't just blanket hate an entire faith. I mean, even those people who identify as Jews or whatever. I mean, people who identify as Muslims or Christians. I mean, that's that's just their issue. That's what yeah. they do. You know, absolutely. Um, but not all of them are bad. No. You know, They're not, not all of them are bad. Not all, not all of them are terrorists. Not all of them are programmed. You know, they are to a degree, but but any any most of the problems that we have anyway, if it isn't a psychopath at the top who's running it, all the minions below it are all simply programmed to follow the psychopath's wishes. Because when you have an organisation which is run by a psychopath, then the moral morality of the psychopath becomes the morality of the organisation, and people are forced to operate in those parameters, even if they're good people. They're forced to step outside their moral compass. You know, and that, that's what we've got to we've got to realise that you know it's just people here, and if we all step back, perhaps we'll uh, we'll, we'll see how we're all being played. You know, good stuff. I've got some questions that it's kind of I guess over the years you'd be up there with, you know, the most frequently recurring guests on various programmes that I've done, which is um, which is terrific. I'm very grateful for it. I've never asked you this. I, I should have asked you this before. This is um, a failing on my part. Is there a place that you visited in the world over the years where you felt that there was more of an elevation in consciousness? Were you ever amongst people, um, whether it be Palestinian people, whether it be people in Central or South America, where you felt that more people, they seemed to get it more than maybe other um, countries, other cultures? There's a question for you now. Look, um, I can't – it's it's hard when you, you're describing the feeling of they get it. I mean, there's certain percentages of awake people everywhere, depending on what you what you term awake. Um, I, I couldn't say there was any country that was more particularly um, connected or more particularly awake than any other country. As far as anywhere with a higher spiritual understanding, there's something particularly amazing about Gaza. It just is. I mean, I don't know. I felt it. As soon as I stepped on the ground when I arrived there, I felt that I was on hallowed ground. It just 
there's something about that place. I don't know whether that constitutes any more awareness in the people or any more lights in the people. Incredibly beautiful, gentle people or childlike people, the Palestinians, not anything like what uh, the world is, is told they are. Um, but I couldn't say there was anywhere. I mean, I, I felt incredible connections in the jungle in Peru. But it, but everywhere you go, it depends on the, the, the consciousness that you're sharing the space with. Any person there, I mean, it's likely to happen anywhere. I couldn't say there was any one place that was outstanding. But there is certainly something special about the Gaza Strip. Brilliant, yeah. I remember spending some time in Costa Rica, in San Jose. And um, I felt that there was... People were more clued in there, not that I spoke the language. And I just had a feeling that people seemed to be more clued in. Max Egan is our guest. It's seven minutes to the top of the hour. Coming up for 5 a.m. where Max is. Top man for getting out of bed to speak to us uh, today. Um, Keep your tweets coming in. There's been plenty of them already. Thanks for them. Uh, It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Max is simply at Max Egan. Just follow Max on Twitter if you haven't done so before. David Stanford tweets, the lie of the controllers goes back thousands and thousands of years. How the hell do we even know what is real? As far as history, that is bullshit. It only, uh, it's only told to us by these liars. And a number of people have tweeted uh, to wish you the very best of luck getting back to Gaza and uh, making that film and meeting uh, with uh, Noor again. JP in Manchester follows your work. Um, wants to say hello to you. Uh, totally respected in my circle, says JP. Uh, keep those tweets coming in. It's at Richie Allen Show. So do you give a little bit of credence then? Because I've dismissed this out of hand. But this isn't a bully pulpit, so I'm quite happy for my ideas to be shot down. I have no problems with that. But I think this whole QAnon thing, you know, the idea that Trump is working within the belly of the beast trying to expose it and destroy it, I think that that's horse manure myself. What do you think of it as a as a theory? Look, I think that um, there's a certain effort to pull down certain criminals and expose them and arrest them and all sorts of stuff, but, but people aren't realising that it's the governmental system itself that is the problem. You know, sure, you can clean it up and you can arrest all what the, the deep state has done, all the people, the psychopaths have gone in there and just gone, you know, totally crazy. I mean, you can think of it, you know, you can think of the government system as being a very, very intricate, delicate system where people have gone in there and they've drawn these really fine lines and you've got the criminal cabal, Hillary Clinton and all these people have come in and they've traced over it all with a crown and they've just gone hard and just harvested all the body parts they can. And so they've got to kind of quell that and get it back to drawing with fine lines again. That's what it's all about, really. You know, I mean, sure, they're going to get rid of a lot of the bad people, but the whole government system is bad in itself. We don't need it. And I'm not seeing any of the stuff. Uh, I'm not seeing it address 5G. I'm not seeing it address the surveillance system. There's even reports coming out from the Q camp that are saying how great the surveillance system has been. I mean, sure, we've all been under surveillance, but that means they've been under surveillance too. So we've been able to get all these tabs on them. And isn't it going to be great? Now we can arrest them. But hey, the surveillance is all still there and you're all still under surveillance and it's all just going the same direction. So, you know, there's good aspects to it and there's bad aspects to it. I can see why it's pulled so many people in. If we do see some major arrests, it's going to pull a lot more people in. And a lot more people are going to put their guard down completely in regard to government. And that's not a good thing. Yeah, and the proof of the pudding, as the old cliche goes, will be ultimately in the eating if these people are arrested. But um, other than that, Trump has proved to be pretty much a perfect Zionist puppet, hasn't he, Max? In terms of everything else that he's done. He has the whole agenda is going forward. I have no doubt there will be some high-level arrests. I mean, whether they will go to jail or whether it will just look like they're going to jail on television is another question. They'll probably just go off to wherever these people go for retirement. Yeah. You know, we, we wouldn't know where any of these people go when we get told they get arrested or go to jail. So, you know, a lot of it is just theatre, but it's going to really um, get cause people to let their guard down in regard to government. You've got to look how, how delicate all these chess plays are. You know, everyone knows the system is corrupt. Everyone wants something to happen. If they don't do some major arrests and they don't make it look like they've actually cleaned up the government system, there will be a worldwide revolution. No doubt about it, because people had enough. You know, it's building and building and building. So they've got to do something to, to say, hey, look, look, we've, we've cl- fixed it all for you. Now we're all back to a good, clean government system. People don't realize we don't need a government system. That's the problem to begin with. 
you know. So you've got to look at how delicate the chess play is and how they've got to restore people's confidence in the mechanism of government. And this is how they do it. Of course, this is how they do it. Folks, our guest is Max Egan, the crowhouse.com activist, um, speaker, writer, artist, um, known Max for many years now. Um, brilliant to have him back on this program. Keep those tweets coming in. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. David tweets, humans work better cooperating with each other. The natural world does. Zebras and warthogs hang out together. The zebra keeps an eye out for the lions. Warthogs provide some serious security to zebras and the lions keep everyone fit. I didn't know that. If that's true, that's terrific. Um, I should have paid more attention to David Attenborough's BBC television programmes. Uh, Trevor tweets, Richie, I learnt a new word from uh, Max, cacistocracy. Please thank him for that. You've got to patent that word, Max, if it is yours, that is. Cacistocracy. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not my word. It's actually a very old word that I, I uh, revamped and I, I found in an old book and I started using it again and it's really taken off. It's been amazing. Like uh, It got used in the White House. Brennan used it when he got sacked. He said, it's about Trump, your cacistocracy is failing. It was in the, the headlines in the paper, the new word that broke the uh, the dictionary, the 30, 374-year-old word that broke the dictionary. Ed, Edward G. Griffin on his website now, he has a cacistocracy section. Ah, his does website, he? A whole right. section <laughs> right. devoted to uh, criminals in uh, in politics. So it's great. The word's really, really taken off, and it's, it's really good to see. And that shows what an influence the independent media can have because I'm just a little nobody, and just that word is now part of the – the whole public discourse again. So that shows how far we can actually reach. I mean, you know, people like Brennan and all these people that are using this word have probably never heard of me, but, you know, the whole seven degrees of separation and all that sort of stuff, it just shows how far we are reaching with the independent media, and it's great. It's great to see it back in use. Brilliant stuff. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. It's uh, only a 90-second break. It's not a long break at all. I better take it if you want to grab yourself uh, another strong coffee there. You've got the time to do that. Um, Max is going to stay with me for another uh, half an hour, maybe a little bit longer. Um, tweet at Richie Allen Show. Follow Max on Twitter as well. There's only one Max Egan on Twitter, at Max Egan. 90 second break. Back with uh, plenty more in, uh, well, in a, in a real short while. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to H2O Actor online. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. Forever. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. Welcome back. Thecrowhouse.com is Max's website. Check it out. Thecrowhouse.com if you haven't uh, checked it out before. Max Egan is our guest and will stay with me for uh, another half an hour. That's uh, with his permission as well. Max, thanks for staying with me. Something disturbed me over the last day or two. And it does take a bit to disturb me. You might or might not be aware because of where you are. But there's been a pretty nasty fire on Saddleworth Moor, which is to the east of um, Manchester. Uh, not far from the Pennines. 
and it's obviously we, we've had this extraordinary run of dry weather which isn't normal for the area we've had temperatures that I know you'd laugh at in Australia but warm temperatures everything is dried out and that area by the way um, the ground it's it's like um, peat land it's um, you know it's 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 uh, it's fuel basically this uh, this uh, soil so over seven seven and a half square miles you've had this fire now a lot of smoke you could see it from space and all the rest of it and it had to be dealt with the army have been brought in to help and what I found very interesting in, and I wish I had a clip I don't have a clip but today a number of people expressed their annoyance at the army being brought in including a couple of fairly high-ranking firefighters who said that while this is a problem and it's going to be difficult to do it they do have the manpower and they could do it themselves and they don't understand why the army are coming in and I thought back to conversations that you and I had uh, over the years not just me and you but me uh, and, and other guests who've been on this program who talked about by stealth how the army will start doing things that civilian um, civilians could do for themselves or the offices of the state the police or fire service should be doing should we be worried Max when we see situations like that today the army getting involved in putting out a fire yeah, well, it's just getting people used to seeing the military on the streets, you know, and bringing on the nanny state. You know, of course, the firefighters, well, you know, this is a real fire, so we can't get the firefighters to do it. We need the real people, the army, to come and fix it, you know, make the people feel safe, you know. Yeah, this is what it's all about. Just get people used to it and to um, delegitimize the um, security forces that we already have, like the, the police and the, the um, firefighters and all of this sort of stuff that we have. Soon we'll have the military probably delivering the mail, Richie. You know, it's uh, it's ridiculous. It's really getting to that point. But they want the military on the streets. They want people to be used to seeing the military on the streets. And they want everyone to know that the nanny state is there to look after them. Yeah. And I'm looking for a photograph while we're speaking. Because Hyde Park in London, I'm sure you visited Hyde Park in your time, Max. Uh, lovely park, a beautiful place. And obviously very busy over the last couple of days because of the heat and all the rest of it and some fascinating pictures today in the Daily Mail of revellers enjoying the hot weather but also of police men patrolling Hyde Park and guess what Max they don't look like police officers they look like the army they've got all the Kevlar gear on um, and they've got semi-automatic machine guns yeah, and of course, around. I've got to say that they're needed to be there because of the revelers, the revelers in the park. This is what happens when you give people too much freedom. They start reveling, they get drunk in public, and we need to bring in the military with submachine guns to fix it all up, you know? Yeah, as you can see, the programming and all of this, Richie. And and the hardware they're using now, because the police don't look like the police anymore, do they, Max? We used to oh, have, no, yeah. not at all. Well, this is the global police force. This is the world police force. It's this black Kevlar outfit. It's in the United States. It's here. It's in New Zealand. It's in England. It's everywhere. It's in everywhere. It doesn't matter where you go. The police have this black Kevlar uniform. It's the world police force. You know, the whole New World Order thing, it's, it's already here. It's just rolling out now in stealth in every country. And just touching on something that one of your guests mentioned before about how they've been doing this for thousands of years, um, I've been really... Um, Looking at history lately, I've been kind of revisiting my roots and looking at history. Something that I found out when I was in uh, in Europe, when I was in Holland, was this mud flood that's gone across Europe that I've mentioned recently. Um, people think this is kind of insignificant and maybe a bit of a red herring, but it's not. There's been this huge mud flood that's gone across Europe, and according to some people, it's been as recently as 1840 that this has happened, in the 1800s anyway, someone I've been speaking to, I've been communicating with in Russia. Uh, says this happened around about 1840. What really seems to be happening here, Richie, is that, that history is being recycled over and over again. There's massive mining operations going on here, and civilizations are periodically destroyed. They're, they're brought up, and then they're, they're wiped out, and then they're brought up, and they're wiped out, and it's happening every few hundred years. So um, everything is, is completely different to what we think. Um, there's remnants of old canal estates all through Florida, the old electricity poles, all sorts of stuff that have been there possibly as recently as 200 years ago. There was another society that existed there um, that we don't know about. 
You know, all we know is what exists in living memory and they're changing history and they're recycling civilizations. It seems to be civilizations rise and fall very quickly. And uh, the government has not been in place for thousands of years, as we believe. Really, when you start looking at dynasties and things, you find that they've recycled dynasties. They've just repeated the same families over and over again and changed the names and made it look like there's been this huge, long chronology, which has created the chronology needed to justify the existence of government, like it's been this gradual thing. But it really hasn't. It appears that um, the world is very, very different to what we think. The, the, the rise of civilization has been very, very different to what we think. A lot of the stuff that we think is very ancient is not really so ancient at all. Something that I really noticed when I was in Peru looking at the stonework in Peru is that it's all very fresh-looking stonework. Look at Sacsayhuaman and Oliete Tumbo and these places made of this kind of softened stone. However they did it, it was very, very strange how they created these walls. But they're very, very fresh-looking walls, very, very fresh-looking stone. I've noticed in, in Greece, the buildings, the, the columns that have fallen down and the old Colosseum in Rome and Greece and all these old, old um, buildings, this all Roman-style architecture. It's the same as the architecture in Washington. In, they got in the government buildings in Washington. The stuff in Greece and Rome is all fallen down and, and uh, destroyed, but the erosion on the stone is no greater than the erosion on the stone in Washington. Wow. It's like they were built at the same time. So what's really going on here with our history, Richie? What's really going on here? Things are very, very different to what we're being told. And there's a lot of evidence to back this up. You know, and all we've got in these history books is just stuff that's written and fed to us. It's all hand-me-downs. And they burn all the libraries all the time. They burn all the books all the time. They burn all the knowledge every time. Every cycle, they seem to burn the knowledge. So, you know, and they're burning the knowledge with this cycle now as well. You know, uh, this is an interesting thing. Um, they're removing all the libraries, as you know, and they're digitizing all the books. So we, all of our information is disappearing from the shelves and it's all um, going into the virtual realm where we believe we'll always have access to it. And you look at the uh, – how what are they doing with this? They're getting – all they've got to do is turn the power off and we lose all of our knowledge. And you look at the first reader that came out. It was the Kindle reader, Kindle, and then you've got Amazon Fire is the new reader that comes out. So the Kindle, you start the fire, and now with Amazon, you burn all the information. And uh, they're telling us what they're doing. But, uh, yeah, history is a very, very different um, thing. It's a very, very interesting subject. And um, it would appear that history is being recycled over and over again. And civilizations are brought up and destroyed um, quite quickly over a period of uh, at least a couple of hundred years, two or three hundred years. And um, interesting, when I was in London as well, when I was doing a talk last year at um, AB8, when I was uh, there in the Midlands, there was a guy talking to me, an engineer who builds bridges, and he says that they used to build bridges to last 100 years, but now they're being told to build bridges and buildings, and they only need to give them a 15-year lifespan. So nothing's really expected to be here after 15 years. So are they planning a new cataclysm, uh, a new destruction of civilization? You know, all the stuff they've been feeding us, waiting for, you know, the tides to rise and the oceans to rise and comets to come and whatever it is they're feeding us. Everyone's expecting the end of the world so they can just bring it on and um, flood this one out and start the cycle again. When I first um, met Eric von Daniken many years ago, I'd read bits and pieces of, of his books and I'd seen some documentaries online and um, was a bit sceptical at the time but then began to look hard at the evidence that he was putting forward and I saw that the evidence he was putting forward was genuine and then having you know being a history graduate as I am it was kind of life-changing for me that to realize that I'd been studying periods of history and regurgitating things that I'd read and learned and been lectured about while this guy was presenting evidence that these time periods, um, all sorts of other things probably were going on. And it's just ignored by, if you want to call conventional historians or, you know, academics or universities, or just ignored. I'm talking about all the evidence that, of course, Von Daniken was um, able to present to the world that suggests that at some stage or another, we were very advanced, maybe more advanced than we are now. And we had capabilities back then that we didn't believe that we had. You know, the Wright brothers flew the first plane and all of that, but it might very well be the case that thousands of years ago, 
you know, all sorts of technological advancements were going on here. How do you feel about that sort of stuff, Max? I, I know I don't really have to ask that, but it's I right th- there. I think it's hard. I think it's highly possible, and I think that the technology still exists. I think that it, it exists in secret places, and we're not told about it. Um, even something I've been considering lately um, that I was going to mention on this week's show was the fact that – you remember when the uh, the Rothschilds bought out the Bank of England back in the, in the war between France and England, the Napoleonic War? Yes. And um, the rumor went out that Napoleon had won the war. That's right. And Rothschild was able to, to buy up the, the British bank for pennies on the dollar. Because all the stocks crashed. And it was 24 hours. It's a good 24 hours before they found out that, oh, no, actually, Nelson had won. So how was Rothschild able to get that message over to England to get that message to Rothschild quicker than the, the, the Crown got it? Because as soon as the battle was won, the messenger went straight to the Crown to say, hey, we won the battle. Yet Rothschild already knew the day before. He, won, he knew as soon as the battle was won. He knew. How did that happen? Did they have radio? How did, how did that message get to him so quickly, like instantly, as soon as the battle was won? Courier and, pigeons, and even, I believe, Max. Even the crown didn't get it until the next day. So, Yeah, apparently, you know. apparently he had a whole, could you say, could you say um, operation? He had a whole operation of carrier pigeons, apparently. Yeah, but carrier pigeons, I mean, didn't the crown have carrier pigeons as well? Yeah. You know, how did it yeah. happen? whole 24 hours before the crown found out that's a pretty big time gap that's a pretty slow carrier pigeon it is i mean yeah. look you raise a really good question but his, 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 his carrier there. pigeon have a little jet jet pack on it or something i mean how did it happen that quickly yeah I've how read, did he get the information look, so quickly so i reckon yeah. the technology that they have i think maybe I mean, yeah. we've got all these underground bases we've got all this stuff they can just say oh look we've just landed here we've just you know because if you were to wipe out most of the civilization now there's going to be pockets left and over one generation you can educate them to any history you want to give them and then you could just have over a period of 100 years 200 years populate 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 rise up this civilization oh look we were inventing all this technology where's all this technology come from so quickly it's snowballed in the last 50 years you know 50 years ago we were, we were just just inventing the television and now look at what we've got in 50 years we've done this it's it's absurd you know but what if the technology already exists and they well, just feed it out little bits of it and just get it to the end of the cycle and then bang wipe them out and then start again or reverse I, I, I love the concept of reverse engineering stuff I love this I mean there are two things I know some of our listeners will think this is just entertainment it's just speculation but it's not just entertainment and not just speculation Max asks a good question despite the fact that Rothschild was known for being first with the news. There is a lot you could say about how did he get that information that quickly to sell those stocks that made it look like Napoleon had won. These are good questions. And as for the technology advancing the way it has done in such a short space of time, like you, I'm not sure that us now as a race, that we came so far so quickly, I wouldn't be surprised if stuff was given or stuff was found or came from elsewhere that was reverse engineered i really do go along with that i know i can't prove any of it of course no more than you can but it has got so far so quick you know uh, we're talking now well, yeah we've yeah we've go ahead, found Mike. stuff like um like the antithikira device we found stuff like spark plugs embedded in rocks um gold chains embedded in coal um Weird stuff, like modern stuff that's embedded in stuff that's supposed to take thousands of years to create. You know, I think things are very, very different to what we're told, and I think that history is recycled. I think that technology exists, and they, we just think that there's this gradual progression from horse and cart up to what we've got now, but this already exists. This is already there. They've got technology way, way beyond what we've got now, probably in these underground bases or whatever, all this, wherever they are, whoever they are. I mean, that's the question. Who is they? What's really going on here? You know, what, what sits behind government? What sits behind banking? You know, the Rothschilds and all this stuff they do, what sits behind that? What's controlling it? What is the longer plan? You know, um, who's really in charge here? What's really going on? But I think a lot of the technology exists and they just recycle civilizations. And so we think it's this gradual buildup. All you need is a cataclysm. All you need is to, uh, to flood something, you know, wipe people out, move everybody close to the shores, wipe the civilization out, raise the water level, whatever. 
You look at all the lost civilizations that exist beneath the oceans, like in the Azores, pyramids and all sorts of stuff beneath the oceans in the Azores. There's lost civilizations beneath the Mediterranean. There's lost civilizations off Indonesia, off the coast of Japan. You've got the Bimini Wall. You've got so many places all around the world. You know, what is it? These aren't just mysteries. These are, are civilizations that existed, and I think they all existed contemporaneously. I don't think that there was ever a Roman Empire. I think that it was a, a worldwide civilization that existed possibly up to as recently as a few hundred years ago, at very most a thousand years ago. I think they've changed history completely. I think they've added at least a thousand years to our, our timeline. Um, nothing is what we're, we're told. I mean, it wouldn't even be surprised if none of the book burnings happened the way we're told. You know, we could just have these uh, situations where we've got all this stuff the way it, it is now. It all gets led into the digital age, and then they burn it the way they've done with Kindle and Amazon Fire. Burn all the information of that age. Do it every time. Recycle again for the next time. You know, increase the mining operations. Um, the Earth's being strip mined. This whole place is being strip mined. We don't need all this stuff we're pulling out of the Earth at all. And um, this is why I have no faith in, in the whole Q thing, even though there's good parts to it. Um, the system of government is the problem itself. We don't need this mechanism at all. Uh, all, it's, all it's there for is um, to control and curtail uh, humanity. It's people farming. That's all these nations are. They're different, different pens, different pens for different people to be run by different governments and, and to curtail them and control them and appease them and, and make them think everything's good. And you've got to bring this whole situation out and expose the corruption and then bring in the nice healing for it all to give people, you know, restored faith in government. And all it's all it's all one big theatre, Richie. It really is. I really would like to see people just just stop what they're doing. Just stop and step away from it. Take a week off, everybody. Just take a week take off. Take a week off get from yourself. Your yeah, get to know your family. Yeah, yeah, and that that analogy you made about people farming, you know, it goes to, it speaks to the analogy made by the Vakovsky brothers. I think that's how you pronounce it. Who made the Matrix? Where ultimately we're a battery. We're we're an energy source for, for 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 a being or beings that are exploiting us. Um, there's no doubt in my mind about that, I think back to my days in commercial and national media, I would have laughed out loud at anybody who said that. I'd have been very rude, very obtuse I would have been, but I see it all around me, um, Max. But, uh, but I also, I, I, I'm also, I'm more optimistic than I was last night. I, I was fed up last night. You know, I, I'd, I'd gotten, I, I, I did a stupid thing yesterday. I was observing conversations that had nothing to do with me on social media between the far left and the right and the right and the old, you know, the alternative left and all the rest of it. And I just got this kind of thinking feeling that I might never live to see, and maybe if I was to have children and grandchildren, they might never live to see a time when people will realise the folly, the sheer stupidity of joining in with a group of whether it's socialists or conservatives, and believing that this is the answer to changing the world and making the place better. I just got this thinking feeling yesterday that it's never going to change that, because it, it, it seems to be getting worse at the moment. Good people, people that we used to know who understood, who saw through the, the illusion that is politics, have abandoned that path which, which, which is true, which goes away from that, and they've jumped on the left-right bandwagon. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with them? They they know better than that. They know it's not the the case. But there is a lot of money in that, and there's a lot of prestige in that, and that's why a lot of these people, I think, have jumped away from the true, the truth, which is, you know, nothing will ever change through politics because the you mentioned Rothschild, of course, uh, Amshel Rothschild famously said, "I don't care who sits on the throne, just give me control of the money supply." That will do for me. So politics is a no-no. But yet people seem to be getting more engaged with it, Max. What do you think? Well, yeah, I think it's frustration. You know, they want they want to see change. A lot of people have been speaking out in the independent media for a long time and they're, they're not seeing anything. They're not seeing any, any fruit come from all the work they've done. And they want to see change. So they're, they're willing to jump onto some bandwagon and, and point the finger. You know, unfortunately, that's what a lot of people want to do. They want to find someone to blame someone to point the finger out and say, it's, it's you guys who spun the web, so we're going we're to point at you. But then that's all they do. I mean, a lot of people will look at that and they'll say, okay, it's the Rothschilds, it's the banking system. And then they'll just sit there and they'll just scream and point at the Rothschilds <laughs> yeah. and they'll do nothing about it. They'll yeah. still support the system 
And okay, so now we'll remove the Rothschilds. Let's remove the Rothschilds. We'll remove the Zionists. We'll remove all these people. Now what? Now what are we going to do? Well, the system's still there, you see, because we hold the system up. You know, it's it's the inner work you've got to do. Once you realize the power that you've got, to power the power to simply say no and ask questions like, who are you people anyway? What makes you think you have a right of ownership over us? What is this this legislation you're enforcing on me? Didn't, didn't we construct legislation and a legal system in order to prevent the causation of harm and to provide remedy when harm is caused, and yet all the legal system is doing is causing harm? So all government does is cause harm. Why do we need you people? We don't. We need each other. We hold the system up. We could step away from it in a day and we could change the entire world in one day if we would stop pointing the finger at other people and just look in the mirror for a little minute and say, hey, you have value. You have value. I have value. I have worth. What I say means something. What I do in my life means something. Just think that about yourself and and realize the power that you have and and connect with people and just live your life. You don't need the government at all. You know, we hold the whole system up, Richie, and and that's the problem. It doesn't matter who we replace. If we're going to give our power away to them and say, okay, we'll we'll pull this guy down. Now, Richie, you get up there and you govern my life Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, what do I want to do that for? And why would you even want to do that? I don't want the position of running someone else's life. I don't want to be organizing things for them. If they can't organize their own life, what are they doing here? You know, this is what life is about, learning how to organize yourself, you know. So, you know, I mean, we don't need government. And, and the whole thing is, is the inner work that we need to do. We hold the whole thing up. It's fiction. It's our belief in authority. And it's this whole illusional matrix that holds us here is just due to this belief in authority. You're right. Pro- and You're right. And for centuries and centuries... Writers have written about demons and they've written about monsters. And, and a recurring theme in those stories is the idea that the boogeyman or the monster only has power over, and I've mentioned this before a few times, it's not as if it's a new idea, but I've mentioned it a few times, but the power it wields is given to it by the person's belief in its ability to, you know, to, to, to hold that power over. You know, if you give the monster all your fear, and if you're afraid of it, and if you believe that the monster can dictate the course of your life, well, then it obviously will. Now, I know that's an analogy, and in real life, it's a bit more different. It's different when they're knocking on your door and telling you that they're going to take your possessions because you didn't pay this tax or that tax or the other. But at the same time, I totally agree with you. It just needs numbers. And the way we get to numbers, in my opinion, and this is not new either, is that we have to start re-engaging with one another on a local level and you you were you 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 came up with a great idea max um some years ago it just needed more and more people to get involved in it i'm talking about full circle of course people need to re-engage with people because if you're living in a neighborhood and you've never spoken to the person next door to you and you don't know his or her name and the the, the family living across you have no idea who they are either you're in a bad place you're in a bad place I think that's where it has to start. Just re-engagement on the most basic level. How you doing, mate? I live across the street from you. My name is Richie. Who are you? And will you come over to my house for a bit of supper? That's how we start, Max, I think. As simplistic well, as yeah, that. That's, that's how we start. I must said that back way on my first interview yeah. back in 2008, Richie. Put common unity back in community. Get to know your neighbours. The people around you are the greatest asset that you have because we are all in this together and the power of a united, respectful community can change the world. You know, the government can't come and do anything to you if you know all your neighbours and all your people realise that the government is there as your employee. They come and start harassing you, you go, hang on a minute, no, no, that's not what we employ you to do. And all the people come out to back you up and say, hey, yeah, what he said, Yes. what are you doing? Yes. You know? But if you don't know them, they're not going to do that. They're going to go, oh, look what Richie's doing. Oh, we shouldn't do what he's doing. Isn't it good to see Richie getting banged on the head? I feel a lot better about myself now. That's the way it is. You know, People feel good when they see someone else getting knocked down because it makes them feel a little bit better in their lives. They don't realize that the reason they feel bad to begin with is because of the same oppression. You know, And we could deal with it. We could walk away from it if we could just respect ourselves enough to respect people around us. You just know, it's to been back- my message the whole time. Absolutely. And just to back you up um, on that... Not that I need to back you up, but a, a, a terrific example of this was a few years ago when Tom Crawford was under pressure in Nottingham and the bank wanted to take back his house wrongfully. He'd been stitched up, he'd been paying 
his um, payments month in, month out for years, but some clauses in his mortgage and some change to the nature of his mortgage that they made without getting his consent resulted in them coming to him and saying, oh, you've only been paying interest for so many years. You've got this enormous debt and we want you to pay it all off or we're taking your house. It was criminal beyond belief. And it took them a long time to get Tom Crawford out of his house because a couple of thousand people turned up from all over the country and said, no, it ain't happening. You're not, we're not going to allow you take this man's house. Now, okay, they eventually got the house from Tom. But it was a little glimpse of what might be. Because if more than 2,000 people turned up, if tens of thousands of people descended on that community and told the bailiffs and told the sheriff and told them the idiot with the briefcase in the bank, you're going to go away and you're going to go away quickly if you want to be eating your supper tonight with your family. And when we're, when we're done with Tom Crawford, we're going to cross to Leicester and we're going to fight for a guy over there who's going to lose his house. You got a glimpse of what is possible if people come together and stand up because that was a real thorn in the side for weeks and weeks and weeks of that bank and that system. But the problem was you need to sustain it and you need tens of thousands. I'll give you an example. Ricky has tweeted, if I say no to paying council tax, I go to prison. You can't do it alone. It has to be massive non-compliance. And of course it does. There's no point in one person in the Fallowfield area of South Manchester saying, council tax, it's, it's a tyrannical tax. I'm not going to pay it anymore. That's right. There's no point one guy saying it or one woman saying it. You need the whole street to go, you're right, mate. It's a tyranny. And what can they do if we all say no? They can't come and take all of our cars. They can't come and take all of our... Uh, possessions, so that's where it it would need to lead. But 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 like you said, Max, and you have been saying it for years. Um, common back in community, you need to get to know the people around you, and you need to be there for them, and trust that they'll be there for you if the situation ever arises, mate. It's it's well, it's, yeah, and you got to realise what you're dealing with is terrorism from government. I mean, that's that's what government uses against the people all the time is terrorism. You know, it's it's intimidation in order to coerce you into compliance. That's what that's the definition of terrorism. If you look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, it's defined as um, violence or the threat of violence carried out against civilians as a means of coercion, often for political reasons. This is what the government does to the people all the time. You know, police use terrorist tactics against the people all the time. Um, even threatening to take your house if you don't comply and and pay this tax. This is terrorism. You know, it's causing harm. Everything government does is cause harm. So the entire legal system is is completely defective. It it um, cancels itself out simply by the harm that it causes because that's not why we created a legal system. You know, and people have to remember what they are and, you know, how, how we created this social system and the social system created government. Government created these laws. They're way down the food chain. We're way above that. And, you know, we need to ask the right questions to these people and we need to unite with our neighbours and, and stand up and call them out for what they are. It's all criminal activity. It's criminal racketeering. That's all government does is racketeering. You know, this is racketeering. It's protection money. We're just paying protection money to these people so that their thugs don't come around and put us in a cage. That's all council tax is. It's protection money. You know, explain this to people in, in no uncertain terms. Maybe they'll get it. And why are we paying protection money to criminals so they can milk our money from us and go and bomb kids in Syria? This isn't making a lot of sense. Why are we putting up with the British government doing this? This is not what we employ them to do. Why are we putting up with it? Absolutely, Max. It was never an any manifesto, which people forget. Listen, thanks for getting up early and coming on with us uh, this morning. I really appreciate that. A lot of interest in, in this Twitter has been lit up there over the last hour uh, or so. Um... Do me a favour, keep us um, posted about going back to Gaza and um, the search for um, young Noor, who'd be 14 now, as you said. Keep yeah, us posted I will. On that. I will. Yeah. I'm still looking at this. I mean, I got the, um, I woke up to a Skype message here about my trip to the Azores. I'm just looking at it. It's like 20, 26 hours or 31 hours to get there. I'm just going, wow, can I really, can I really do this to myself again after what I've just done? But um, I'm, I'm thinking about it, and I'll, I'll let you know how it goes with the embassy. I, I really, really do want to go to Gaza. It means a lot to me to go and, and find this little girl again. I think it would be a great film to bring to people as well. It may be able to bring a human story to the people. They may see what's really going on there. Maybe it'll open their hearts up a little bit to the plight of the Palestinian people. 
And it would be a beautiful thing to do. It'd be something. It'd be something in my life to fulfil a mission that I've wanted to do for the last six years, anyway. So yeah, I will definitely keep you posted on that. Brilliant, mate. Thanks for for doing it. Um, in your downtime, you've been around the world and back again, as you've said. Um, good luck with the. You know, if the Azores, if you do do it, he sounds like you might be having second thoughts, but if you do uh, do it, um, you know, keep us uh, posted on that TED Talk as well. And uh, Godspeed to you, mate. Thanks for coming back on. And get, I really do appreciate that. I'm not paying lip service to it. You're getting up so early to do it. Um, I really do appreciate it. And I look forward to speaking to you again real soon, Max. Thank you, brother. Pleasure. Always a pleasure. Marvellous, my friend. Have a great day there. Max Egan, go to thecrowhouse.com, folks. And you'll find The Crow House on YouTube as well because Max obviously makes a terrific programme, a broadcast every week. Check it out if you haven't checked it out before. All the details at thecrowhouse.com.